So my name is Kelly Lunston. I'm the business segment manager for advanced cytometry for BioLegend. Um, it was about exactly a year ago this month that we first released Brilliant Violet 421. Um, Brilliant Violet 421 was a bit of a revolution in fluorescence chemistry, um, and it has significantly helped us um, grow and expand our ability and the, the cleanliness with which we can do multicolor flow cytometry. And as of next month, we'll have released seven different Brilliant Violet conjugates that will all be excited off the violet laser that will replace Q dot nanocrystals or nanocrystal technology almost entirely. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, are all the implications of, um, of new fluorescent technologies and multicolor flow cytometry, and how we're gonna incorporate those into our panels. All right, so first what I'm gonna discuss, um, my expertise is actually in fluorescence chemistry. So I think it's, it's extremely important to acknowledge not only the strengths, but also, also the weaknesses of all, um, of all technology platforms that you use. And all fluorophores are not created the same. And it doesn't mean that because something has a weakness that we don't use it. It means that we understand how things work in order that we can balance them into a panel. And that's actually why I call this talk multicolor chi, because there are no right or wrong answers. There's no ubiquitous statements that we can make to be true for all things. It's about understanding our biology, our tools, our instruments, our reagents, and being able to balance them together in order to get the results that we want in a high content, high throughput manner. So first, what we're gonna talk about are the different fluorophore families um, and the limitations of those chemistries. We're gonna also talk about how that relates then to balance and panel composition. So things like, a lot of these might seem quite trite, balancing dye expression, or I'm sorry, dye brightness with antigen expression. That seems extremely easy, <laughs> right? And when you're doing five color flow cytometry or six color flow cytometry, these things are actually quite easy. It's when you start getting above eight to 10 to 12 to 15 to 17 colors that this becomes actually a very significant challenge for lots of different reasons that we'll discuss as we go along. So there's different implications for each of these, um, these different factors. Um, second would be identifying different biological concerns or assay concerns. These would be things like PMA stimulation, where your CD4, which otherwise you might want to put on a relatively dim floor in order to free up some of your better, brighter floors, uh, no longer can go on a dim floor. It has to go on something that's um, actually quite a, a, bright, um, a bright floor for. Um, that would be other things like using chemotherapeutic um, samples, things where you don't know the time from which that patient received their last chemothera chemotherapeutic event and um, the time at which you're actually going to analyze. Um, there is a ton of endogenous autofluorescence in the world. You are entirely autofluorescent <laughs> for a lot of reasons, right? And that's the same with um, a lot of um, drugs that we use and a lot of chemotherapeutic reagents that we use. They're often extremely highly autofluorescent. Um, and that's actually the same with your different cell types. You know, my skin is doing a fantastic job at protecting my DNA from the assault of UV irradiation from the sun because it's filled with a bunch of autofluorescent molecules that are dissipating that energy for me in the form of antioxidants. So whether or not I'm using skin or I'm using spleen or I'm using brain, all of these are gonna have varying levels of background. Um, there's going to be then limitations for our instrument. You know, we're really quite lucky that we have instruments that are 20 parameters or 18 colors. Um, you know, a lot of the reagents that we have are not quite there yet to give us <laughs> really easy to construct 18 color panels. You know, I'm pretty much maxed out at 16 at this point. Um, but, you know, we do have instruments that are going well beyond that, like the Astrios from Beckman Coulter as, as an example. So, you know, electronics is definitely leading the way or engineering is leading the way. We need to start responding with better reagents and better fluorophores in order to have a faster, higher throughput system. And then finally, what I always say is when you have all these different variables, um, you kind of understand them, you have your best first guess at what a good panel construction would be, it's test and repeat, test and repeat. When you're going to 15 colors, I can guarantee you it's not gonna work the first time you do it. <laughs> it's not reasonable <laughs> to think that you're gonna have a lot of variables put together and without proper testing, that it's just gonna miraculously work out of the gate. It doesn't work that way. But it doesn't mean that it's not worth doing, especially for samples that are precious. Or, um, or things that you want to do in a high throughput manner. So we're also going to talk not just about how to balance these factors in panel construction, but also then all the controls that go into having confidence in your data. And, you know, there is no single perfect control for all things. Isotype controls are not the perfect ubiquitous control for the background of all things. That's not what happens in multicolor flow cytometry anymore. 
because all of a sudden we have a ton of protein because all of our PE and APC conjugates are protein and they're very big protein, you know, pieces of protein. And there can be a lot of nonspecific binding due to the fluorophore, due to antigen specific interaction. There's a lot of background. It's not just nonspecific binding, but it's the background of all these things spilling over into each other that requires us to start using things called fluorescence minus one controls. And those are gating controls. They let me know that not only do I have an accurate gate every time I run that assay, <laughs> right, so that I have internally consistent information, but then it also lets me know when my reagent is starting to degrade on me and I have to get a fresh reagent because the percents are changing based on the FMO. So it allows me to have confidence and reproducibility in the data that I derive from a 15 color assay. Um, there, are, there is a time and a place for isotype controls. I used to say that they were completely worthless, but that's because I'm not an immunologist. I have since understood that there are things like macrophage or dendritic cells or monocytes that do have a significant amount of nonspecific binding that is due to things like Psi5 or just generally they're scavengers. They're going to pick up lots of things. Um, and so we're going to show an example of where that actually is an important control. But generally, um, the entire talk and really what concerns most people on a day-to-day -day basis is not compensation, although they, they, they put that word in their brain as if it's the thing to fear, what they're really worried about is a loss of resolution or a loss of sensitivity. Because what we're gonna talk about extensively is just how intensely meaningless that term compensation actually is. I can change that value just by turning up my voltage, but it does not change the resolvability of my population. Those two things are not synonymous. They're involved with one another, but they are not synonymous. So we're gonna go over that at every stage throughout this entire talk. So let's just start with the floors. Um, this is gonna be about the first third of the talk, honestly. I think from my perspective, that is the most important thing. You've got you know, 15 of these things going on in your assay and they're just as important as your antibody. You're not seeing your antibody. You're not seeing your marker. You're seeing your fluorophore. If your fluorophore isn't linear, Right? If it's non-specifically interacting with things, you cannot trust your results. Right? You need to understand how it's working in order to understand how to troubleshoot it. So historically, we were always kind of stuck with <laughs> or um, relying heavily upon organic, simple organic structures like the alexafluors, the psi dyes, now the dilite dyes, mega stokes dyes. There are all sorts of fun dyes. Right? Um, one of the reasons that we love them is that they are derived in nature, right? Um, the Fitzy structure, for example, is related to an, an antioxidant molecule, a B, a, v, a B vitamin that, you know, we find all over our skin. Um, they can be tuned to whatever particular wavelength we are interested simply by adding side chains or adding different, um, you know, a phenol ring or, you know, adding to the structure. For organic fluorophores, when they are really small, like this, things in the coumarin family where they're naphthalene derived, um, they tend to be excited by extremely high energy short wavelengths. And this is an inherent limitation to their structure. It's advantageous that they are capable of being excited by short energy. However, the, one of the biggest limitations is that because you can kind of imagine that each double bond is sharing an electron pair and those electrons are what is, is actually absorbing the energy. This molecule, because it's so small, only has a limited capacity to ever absorb energy. And basic physics tells us that I can't emit more energy than I absorb, right? So inherently blue will always be dim as a floor. And because the structure is very simple, it's also gonna be very sensitive to photobleaching. But the brightness of this molecule, or its capacity to absorb energy, is only one factor. It's also background. And as we all know, in biology, because we're always protecting our DNA from the sun, most of these molecules um, are also autofluorescent. You know, we have a ton of autofluorescence in, in the blue emitting range for exactly that reason. So as I start to tune this molecule to become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, I encounter a family called the rhodamine-based fluorophores. And these are many of the alexafluors that are in the visible range things like um, Alexa 568 or Alexa 594 or Texas Red. It's extremely easy to be green, right? This molecule is super small, super soluble, um, has really nice tight emission and excitation. 
Um, it gets significantly harder as we, as we try to tune this molecule to be further and further near infrared, for example. The molecule becomes bigger and bigger, and I only have so many places where I can add side chains where this molecule stays soluble. One of our biggest challenges in making PE Texas Red or um, any of the Texas Red derivatives is that these molecules start to become relatively hydrophobic as these rings become bigger and more bulbous. And so we end up having to use a ton, uh, like the molar ratio of Texas Red to the phycoerythrin just becomes prohibitive and it tends to precipitate quite a bit. And that's one of the limitations that we have in making a really good PE Texas Red tandem. Um, so in the near infrared, we come to rely really heavily on cyanine dyes. You can see that the structure is significantly different than the rhodamine-based dyes. They have their own strengths and weaknesses, right? These guys, their strength is that they do get us into the near infrared, right? <laughs> That's a pretty big strength. <laughs> One of their weaknesses is that because they're a dimeric molecule, they're a reflection of each other. If I'm a reactive oxygen species and I'm really hungry and I need to neutralize myself on a double bond someplace, I'm going to look at this linker and say, yum, yum, I know exactly where to neutralize myself. So these molecules, a lot of, you'll hear a lot of people say, I think Psi 5 has been cleaved from my tandem. Cleaved? Not exactly. More like photobleached. <laughs> there is the potential that it's been cleaved once one of these bonds has been broken, um, leaving behind half a molecule that's no longer capable of the same excitation and emission properties. But more often than not, these molecules can actually be quite photo, um, photo unstable as well. And that's just a nature of being an organic dye, right? They will not have absolutely fantastic photostability. They can't. It isn't their job. Their job is to absorb energy. And being in that activated state is a sensitive place for them to be, which causes them to photobleach. It's a natural process of life for them. Um, if, however, dyes are released, that come under different names, things like um, H7 or um, different, you know, V450. If the spectra is identical to two, between two different floors of, this, of different names, then the structure is the same. They have not literally made an advancement outside of sulfonating a molecule or aminating a molecule. There aren't many changes that I can make to a molecule to actually make these guys all that much better. I'm still, I'm limited in how far I can tune them and still meet the requirements for physics. So that's actually, you know, why we rely so heavily on proteins. So proteins are the second family that we've historically used for the last 15, you know, plus, you know, 15, 20 years. And why we love proteins like phycoerythrin is that this molecule is 240 kilodaltons. It's twice the size of my antibody and it's a protein, right? I can't freeze it because it does not like to be frozen and thawed. You know, that particular process is extremely hard on any protein, including my skin, right? Um, but why we love it is that I like to put this structure up because I think most people think of PE as being its own fluorophore and it's not. PE can have anywhere between 10 to 20 chromophores that are embedded in the protein structure. The majority of the 240 kilodaltons is protein. It's protein that's embedding the floors so that I can have the benefit of a one-to-one -one conjugation between PE and my antibody, but be benefiting from the fluorescence of 10 chromophores. Right? That's why we love it so much, and that's why it's almost impossible to make a synthetic phycoerythrin. It's actually extremely difficult even to make it in a bioreactor because of the tertiary structure. The folding process is quite intricate. Um, some people try baculovirus for that reason, but it never produces typically as good of a PE as if you actually just purified it out of the algae. So that purification process, that production process, you can imagine that sometimes we might have a limitation on how much PE is available when things like tsunamis happen, <laughs> because there goes all of our algae <laughs> that we were trying to use to purify for our biological assays. Um, so, you know, PE, APC, per CP, GFP, these guys will also be extremely sensitive to solvents. I don't know how many times on listservs you see over and over again, when I do microscopy and I've got GFP expressing in my sample, I don't see it after I fixed it. Well, of course you don't see it. Would you dip your hand in methanol? Don't dip your phycoerythrin or GFP or any other biological specimen that contains a protein that needs to be fluorescent and rigid into a denaturing solvent. It's going to collapse. It's going to no longer, it's going to release it from its rigidity, 
which is an inherent factor that's required for it to be fluorescent. It's going to relax it so that it's no longer capable of being fluorescent anymore. Um, so in order to get us more into the near infrared, organic floors have a strict stoke shift. They have a strict excitation and a strict emission. And there's not a very big um, distance between those two things spectrally. If you see a fluorophore that has a very short excitation but a very long emission, it's a tandem because it's physically extremely difficult for the fluorophore itself to have a big stoke shift. So that's why we rely on these guys, ex excellent donors, right? These guys have over a million extinction coefficient, excellent absorbers, excellent donors, which makes them great partners for a fret, right? So we use things like Psi 5, Psi 3, Psi 7, Psi whatever to couple with these guys in order to get us a further near infrared um, emission, um, thus giving us more colors that we can analyze at a single time, right? Um, but limitations are definitely stability and size, for sure. So along comes nanocrystals. You know, nanocrystals have strengths and, <laughs> strengths and weaknesses as well. Back in the day, you know, five, six, seven years ago, they were the only thing that got you above 10 colors. That's their strength, <laughs> is that they gave us the ability to do multicolor. Their weaknesses are that in space, they are about the same size as a phycoerythrin, but they're like a bowling ball, right? So if PE is a big piece of protein snot, I'm an antibody, it's shackled to my ankle, and I want to get through that door, I can probably pull a piece of snot that's twice as big as I am through that door. What I can't pull through that door is a bowling ball that's twice my size that's shackled to my ankle. The door is not big enough. So an inherent limitation of Q-dots is going to be their size and thus their limitations for permeability to a cell. Because if we want to get them inside, the holes that we would have to blow in the surface of our cells are so big that in multicolor we could potentially end up perturbing the quantifiability of our cell surface antigens. So that's why I like to say that the brilliant violet floors as a family are almost like synthetic organic dyes and proteins got together, had a baby, and the baby just happened to have the best of both of them. <laughs> it has the stability of an organic floor. I can put it in methanol. I can put it, it's raised in acetone. So there's very little that I can do in terms of solvents to hurt this molecule. Um, I can microwave it if I want to. The only thing that I can't do is put it next to the sun because like any other fluorescent molecule, it's gonna still be light sensitive, right? Um, it's about 70, 72 kilodaltons. Um, it's in a big, long string. It's kind of shaped like, a, ho like a, a horseshoe, and that's because of the kinks of the double bonds that link each of the monomers together to form the polymeric um, structure. Um, and you can kind of imagine that that's exactly what it is. It's as if I took 70 kilodaltons worth of Pacific Blues, caused them to have enough of a linker that they didn't fret together, they're far enough away that they're not interfering with each other, but they are transitioning energy along a very long chain of double bonds, right? It makes it extremely efficient. Um, and so thereby, because I have so many of them on a single molecule, and we conjugate more than one polymer per antibody, versus PE is always a one-to-one -one with the antibody, it means I'm benefiting from a lot of monomers in terms of the fluorescence of that individual event. So that kind of takes us to brightness. There's a lot of, you know, when we think of brightness, um, we can think of it on many different levels. The brightness of a single element, the brightness of our antibody, but really what, we, what we're most concerned with is in situation, what's our signal to noise? Because brightness is only one element of that equation. So there is a condition called collisional quenching that easily, when I used to work at molecular probes, dealing with a lot of different chemistries, <laughs> was probably one out of five questions in technical assistance all the time. Our mentality is that more is better. More is never better in biology. We all know that. We are always maintaining homeostasis. We have this perfect place in the middle where everything is perfect. And that's the same with the number of fluorophores that are conjugated to the antibody to result in the brightest antibody that we can have for quantitative detection. Right? So for example, um, if I had an antibody, 145 kilodalton antibody, normally the molar ratio would be somewhere between about six alexafluor 488s per antibody, about four fluorescenes per antibody, about three alexa 647s per antibody. 
PE, always a one-to-one -one because of the size, right? There's always these different ratios based on the floor that's going to be ideal, where they'll be able to resist collisional quenching but give us the brightest signal. So say that I thought more is better. I'm going to add a molar ratio of 10 to 1 to this antibody. Well, great for me. All I did was waste my money because what will happen, conjugation is a random event. They're conjugating to any available lysine residue, um, which is the most singly abundant amino acid in the construction of an antibody. So it's a good target to go after to make sure we're getting enough on. Um, so in this case, because it is random, there's always the likelihood that two fluorophores will accidentally conjugate too close to one another. Conjugation is irreversible. That's why we just don't randomly lose floors from our antibodies. <laughs> it's irreversible. So because they accidentally conjugated too close to one another, when they jump up to their excited state, you can imagine that their pi cloud expands. Now you have an electron that's existing at any point in that orbit at any point in time, right? And that's an expansion. If the, if the fluorophores are conjugated too close to one another, their, their excited states interfere with one another. Literally, an electron from the excited state of one fluorophore randomly ejects itself and lands in the excited state of the other fluorophore that's its neighbor that's too close. It's a proximity event because it's a, it's a statistical likelihood based on distance. So when that electron hits the other one, both of them drop down to ground state because their excited states have been interfered with. That doesn't mean they're photobleached. They're not broken. They'll keep getting excited, they'll keep interfering, and they'll keep dropping down. You see this a lot with DAPI. If you put DAPI in your mounting media in microscopy and when you initially image it, it looks fine. Three months later, you pull out that slide again, every single molecule of DAPI has has packed itself into the nucleus so that when they're excited, they're smack next to each other, bound very tightly to that piece of DNA. And what you see are little black spots all over your nucleus. Those black spots are a quenching event that tells you that the density of the DAPI is too much in particular places. So that's what limits the brightness of an antibody. But this also relates to tandems. We rely heavily on tandems. They are not a bad word. We need them. They constitute half of the fluorophores that we're going to use in any particular assay. Um, but there's definitely strengths and weaknesses to them as well. Because that conjugation event of the acceptor to the donor is a random event, there will always be the likelihood that I conjugate an acceptor that is not close enough to a donor to transition energy then there's always the likelihood that I'll have an acceptor photobleach, leaving the donor just to emit where it's supposed to emit. So say that this was PE size 7, there is always going to be the potential that the size 7 acceptor has cross-beam excitation with my red laser, causing me spillover into its channel off the red laser. And there's always this possibility that over time, because size 7 is particularly sensitive to light, that I'll see them photobleaching, causing an increase in intensity or background into my PE channel, a change in the comp value. And that's why I really like it when people use tandems on things that they know that they'll replenish relatively quickly so that they don't see that degradation effect over time because they're shutting down the amount of time they're using the reagent, basically. The faster you can go through a tandem, the better. That's why APC Psi 7, for example, great on things like Psi 4 or CD4 or CD45 or CD19, things that you use really abundantly and can totally handle the dim dye. Okay, size is definitely an issue. Um, you know, we kind of already talked about how big Q dots are. This is actually the smallest one. The ones that are about 655 or 605 are actually as big as this antibody. And as they start to um, become 705 and 800, they become pod shaped. And that actually is a direct reflection of the emission spectrum of the Q dot as well. They start becoming extremely cumbersome. Um, another good one is um, GFP being 30 kilodaltons or 32 kilodaltons in that range, where the chromophore itself is probably not even 400 daltons. It's tiny, right? And the majority of the bulk of this molecule is the protein that's simply allowing that fluorophore to exist, to work. Okay. So there's, you know, the direct comparison for utility of the brilliant violet dyes are Q dots or um, e-fluor nanocrystals from eBio. 
Um, and they're like comparing apples to oranges in a lot of ways. Although we are using them off the violet laser, they don't have the, st the same strengths and weaknesses. For example, um, Q-dots, or any nanocrystal technology that's based on cadmium selenide or tellurium, um, or um, cadmium telluride, is going to have excitation spectra that are extremely promiscuous between all the different lasers. Um, you know, ideally, because they're semiconductors, right, they're going to be extremely happy to be receiving extremely high intensity, high energy wavelengths. That's what semiconductors do. They're excellent solar panel material for that reason, right? However, in systems where we have um, four lasers or three lasers on our LSR2s or our Fortessas, um, that means that any particular Q dot is going to spill over into that identical filter set off of every single laser indiscriminately, okay? But again, not to poo-poo them so much because they were all we had for a really long time to get us to where we are now, okay? <clears throat> but the brilliant violet floors are significantly dis different. They're organic, which means they have discrete excitation and emission. So there is no generality that I can make about what that spillover value is going to be because everyone's configuration is very different. For example, our BV605 has extremely limited excitation at the, um, 488 or off the blue laser. It's fantastic if all you have is a three laser system of a violet, blue, and red. It's great because it isn't going to interfere with PE Texas Red at all. Um, but things like um, BV650, it is somewhat excited by the red. Not nearly as bad as Q.655, but it's still going to have some crossbeam compensation that you'll have to deal with. The question isn't whether or not it has compensation. It's about whether or not that spillover is causing you to lose sensitivity. If you're maintaining population resolution, it doesn't matter what that value is, period. All right? It's all just mathematical balancing by the software. So these are the current scope of every Brilliant Violet floor that we have. They are now Brilliant Violet 421, Brilliant Violet 510, Brilliant Violet 570, Brilliant Violet 605, Brilliant Violet 650, Brilliant Violet 711, and Brilliant Violet 785. Seven. We had to add a new PMT to our Violet just to handle our own dyes. So it's, and they can all be used simultaneously for phenotyping. There's no exclusion that needs to be applied, but there's a lot of logic that has to happen for that panel to be constructed cleanly. So the only, of the seven polymers that we currently have, or the seven products that we currently have, only two of them are polymers alone. Brilliant Violet 421 and 510 are both polymers alone. They are not tandems. But again, anytime you have a short wavelength excitation and a long wavelength emission, you assume you're working with a tandem. So all of the rest from 570 up are tandems with acceptor fluorophores. <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of break it down. We haven't um, completed a 100% perfect staining index at this point. We will very soon that we can send you. Um, however, this is our pretty much best educated guess on how these guys are in terms of brightness. So the brightest brilliant violet fluorophores that we have um, are Brilliant Violet 421 and Brilliant Violet 605. The brightest floors that you can use at all in an assay are BV421, PE, PE Sci5, APC, and Brilliant Violet 605. Those are the five brightest floor floors that exist right now. Um, but that does not mean that they have equal utility. PE Sci5 is a pain in the butt to include in an assay. It's got so much cross beam comp that I'm often completely obscuring my sensitivity in APC. So just because something is bright, doesn't make it the right answer, right? They all have their own personality. So in this instance, um, you know, initially when we were first making material, we always make some of the basic phenotypic markers like CD3, CD4, CD8. And we realized really quickly that to take such a bright fluorophore like BV421, where there's very little black background in that channel outside of autofluorescence, um, applying it to something like CD3 really doesn't make a lot of sense. If that's the marker that fits best in that channel, Pacific Blue is fine. You don't need to have the brightest thing on every marker. Sometimes that actually hurts you. Um, that is not, you know, I save this channel for what I need to be most sensitive. 
So, you know, a really good example is it's extremely difficult to resolve FOXP3. Even once you dump CD127, to get that positive population to pop out is really, really, really hard, right? If anybody's ever done that, it's, it can be a little frustrating and very variable between donors and between situation. So, you know, having CD25 on something that is quite bright in order to get that population to pop out is really important. Normally, I would not personally use a quadrant gate here. Um, I would use my FMOs to show me where my negatives are for both of these markers, and I would gate on the space in between. Um, but that's a really good example of getting that population here to pop out and give me a very clearly positive signal, very positive um, population. Um, Brilliant Violet 605, I am in love with this molecule for cytokines. I think that I would like to see us conjugate it to every random cytokine, cytokine receptor, <laughs> chemokine receptor, anything like that. Um, it's going to be really fantastic to diversify a panel for the real special interesting things that you want to look at. Um, the next brightest, so this would be kind of the four out of five level brightness floors, would be the Brilliant Violet 650, also really nice and, nice and bright. I'd like to see it on lots of cytokines as well. Um, Brilliant Violet 711, um, in this case we had it on CD8. Um, really, really pops up there. And Brilliant Violet 510, which was quite a surprise. Again, this guy is just the polymer. He's not in a tandem. He's got no excitation off the blue laser because he's not a tandem, which is really helpful. So if you're not using Live Dead Aqua and you want to use this channel to phenotype, we have figured out that this guy is at least 10 times brighter, minimum. And we haven't done an extensive test of all the conjugates that we have, but we know that we're 10 times brighter or more. Or more. Um, and we'll have more testing on that soon as well. All right, so the third brightest, so this is kind of a three out of five, and Fitzy would fall into this range. Fitzy actually is not a particularly bright floor, but on a four laser system, the Fitzy channel has extremely little spillover into it. So it's a really great channel to maintain resolution, even though it itself is not particularly bright. Um, in this instance, the Brilliant Violet 570 and the Brilliant Violet um, 785, they both fall into this category. Um, the 785, we, do, um, we determine brightness based on staining index and the background, or the, 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 the um, standard distribution of the negative on the BV 785 is a little bit broader, um, which um, kind of takes into account making it a three out of five. But great for phenotyping. You know, I would like to see 785 on lots of maturity markers, HLA, DR, CD45, RA, KI67, things that you would love to have to be able to add into a panel. <clears throat> so just to start touching on compensation a little, um, you know, there are a lot of things that we learned that most people have never seen in flow cytometry working with this family in testing. Um, first of all, Compensation is voltage. <laughs> Those two things are hand in hand and absolutely inextricable. Um, for example, um, I, I honestly believe that you should never, ever, 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 ever look at compensation percents without taking into account the voltages. They should always be presented together because one is meaningless without the other. What ends up happening, and we'll go over this later, is you can have an over amplification of the spillover when the differential of the voltages between those two PMTs is too high. Anytime you have 200% spillover of a spectra that looks like it's only bleeding over 10%, logically you know that that's not true. That's an artifact of something you created by having an imbalance in your voltages. So just for as a really quick example of, on average, if things were well balanced, what you should expect, this would be about reasonable. So this is the channel and it's the removal of, um, um, of V500 from all of these channels, for example, or BV570 from all of these channels. Um, BV57 out of PE, people are concerned with the acceptor being Psi3, um, being directly excited again by the 561 laser and emitting into PE. It's really not that bad. Um, as long as the voltages again are, are balanced well, this should not be really hurting resolution all that badly. We specifically chose acceptors for these molecules in order that they weren't excited 100% by the other lasers, so that we weren't making it more difficult for ourselves, right? Um, what I thought was most funny 
is everyone was concerned with BV570 bleeding into PE, and really what they should be concerned about is PE bleeding into BV570. If you think about how fluorophores work, all those side chains, they're excited by short wavelength excitation. We just barely ever see it because we're not, we're not as concerned. We're so concerned with all the cross-beam comp that we don't really think about the fact that PE is also affecting the background contribution to the BB570 channel. Um, but again, this is because of this you know, slight differential. You're seeing a little bit of an over-amplification here. But we'll go over that a little bit more. And again, it's that value, meaningless. What we're concerned with is background and resolution. We've come to equate that with compensation, and that's not a fair equation, uh, equating. So lots of things can cause background. Um, <laughs> the one I had to learn the most about was metabolic activation of the cells. And it makes absolute sense. Do you know how many of your cofactors are autofluorescent in the blue range? It's logical, <laughs> right? They're the same sort of antioxidants that are protecting me. They're, you know, so they're going to be quite abundant. As a cell becomes metabolically more active, like neurons, for example, are highly autofluorescent because they're so extremely metabolically active. Um, obviously, that's going to make a really big difference in what your background is. And in this instance, if I am looking at cytokine expression, I need to have a stimulated, um, I have to have stimulated and unstimulated controls to qualify correctly for what the actual background or negative population is. Um, there could be all sorts of exogenous treatments that we talked about before, things like chemotherapeutics, but you know, there's lots of other things that, are pe that people are adding or samples that they're getting from unknown sources. Um, there could be lots of things that contribute to your background. Um, the most obvious is fixation. I know a lot of people that are in the habit of, um, you know, it takes a long time sometimes to stain up a 15 color panel, especially when you're doing stimulation and you're doing cytokine detection or FOXP3. It can take most of your day sometimes to do that staining. A lot of people will put their cells into PFA and just leave it. <laughs> when you stick your hand into PFA, I can guarantee you it's fixed entirely at the surface within five minutes. <laughs> when something is dead, it's dead. It's not coming back to life again. You do not have to continue the process of, of cross-linking. That is what the PFA is doing for fixation. It's cross-linking primary amines. So if I have two small little hydrocarbons that both have a little baby primary amine on them and I cross-link them, shazam, all of a sudden I created a blue molecule because that's biology. That's the diversity of biology. So don't create a situation that isn't necessary. You're only hurting yourself or shooting yourself in the foot by increasing the background because you fixed way too long. Nonspecific binding, obviously a big issue, <laughs> especially as I've learned with sci 5 um, on some... Um, and some monocytes. Um, but there's lots of different reasons for nonspecific binding. The best is um, using <laughs> things like anti-mouse antibodies on, you know, on mouse tissue or things that you know, obviously just species-wise don't make a lot of sense. But also, anytime you use streptavidin, biotin is a cofactor. You have a ton of biotin in your mitochondria. Actually, in microscopy, we use biotin or we use streptavidin fluorescently labeled by itself to do mitochondrial localization. That's nonspecific binding, and an isotype control is not going to help me with that. Right? Applying the secondary, the streptavidin, with no primary that's biotinylated, that's going to tell me what my background is. You use an endogenous biotin blocking kit in that case prior to adding your antibody. Um, what most people don't think about until they start progressing beyond six to eight colors, I would say probably more than eight, is the additive bleed through of all the floors into all the channels. That's why I talk a lot about the assaulted channels. You have certain channels like PE, B, um, PE APC, and BV421, where at least the floor you're trying to detect in that channel is quite bright. It can handle a little bit of background from all your PE and APC tandems. Alexa 700, cannot. It's an extremely dim floor that has a whole lot of fluorophores that are bleeding over into it quite a bit. And when that additive effect becomes too much, I lose my ability to resolve anything that's positive for Alexa 700. Okay? <clears throat> and that would obviously be on a fully stained sample. 
So that's background, but obviously it's signal to noise or signal to background. Um, signal intensity is going to make a humongous difference, so we have to ensure not only that we have a good match of abundance of the target to brightness of the floor, but also that we make sure it's got good access. I had to learn the hard way that CD11C can't have EDTA in solution because it blocks its binding. It's a calcium dependent binding. That's good to know, right? Or another good example are people that um, are doing intracellular staining um, for FOXP3, but they're trying to make it go real fast. Well, you've got to get through the nuclear membrane too. You've got to make sure that it's, it's, you let it sit there for the full amount of time to have good permeabilization so that you've got good access so it can actually work. Right? or use temperature as an accelerant to that process. Um, and then obviously, just good balance in all things. You have to make sure that everything is well matched. All right, so when we're actually setting up the panel, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, and there, this also determines how we gate, because gating is not an art, it's a science. And we're going to go over many different ways in which you can accurately gate through the rest of the presentation as we start looking at the data. So you're going to um, have very obvious yes or no expression. Those are easy. They pop way out there. They're in a nice little tight population. Super easy to gate. Can use quadrant gates to get those guys. They are basic phenotypers. They do not deserve my best eyes. Right? CD4 outside of a really bad PMA stimulation would never deserve BV421 or PE, right? That would be a misuse of a balance. Um, you're obviously going to have a lot of different low expressors or maturity markers, things with a wide dynamic range. These need FMOs to tell you clearly what's positive and negative. Um, anything where there's a high and low population, it's quite difficult to discriminate those things and it needs to be very internally consistent. Um, those often get my things like PE size 7 or PECF594 or Alexa 647 or something like that. And then finally, I have my rare or random events. Actually, that's usually where I save Alexa 647. Alexa 647 is quite bright of a fluorophore that I have a ton of flexibility with because if I get some randomly new expressed or, or made you know, antibody from a um, from a collaborator in Nebraska, and it just shows up on my doorstep without having to spend $1,000 to get it custom conjugated, I can do this conjugation myself. And I know that I'm getting it conjugated to something that's bright enough that I can get a first pass assessment at the quality of what I received. It's a flexible place. Um, but generally, I'm going to save all of my best floors for the things that matter the most. This is usually why I'm doing the experiment, is this question. I'm going to save it for my best. There's obviously lots of instrument considerations. I'll show you what our current configuration is, but this can change wildly. We can make our cytometers into whatever we want. There are 10 laser cytometers out there. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to go over, once I have a good idea of how I'm setting up the panel, titrate your antibodies, how to control, um, how to apply your controls, um, how to gate for cytokines, and then compensation always, and, and how to balance a loss of sensitivity. So primary tier is going to be yes or no answers. <laughs> I like that we use this as a test because we, you know, people do actually sell NK1.1 V450, for example. This is completely unacceptable, right? I am either an NK cell or I am not an NK cell. I'm not thinking about becoming an NK cell, right? This should be a clearly resolved population. It does not mean that I should put it on PE because it is only a basic phenotypic marker. It shouldn't take one of my best floors. What I would use it on often is when I want to get to 15, 16 colors, I have to use PE Sci 5 whether I want to or not. Most people are dumping their NK cells to clean up their T cell population. If I dump PE Sci 5, this guy is not co expressing with anything else on the rest of the cells that I want to analyze, then I don't care what the comp is for this guy into anybody else because he's not co expressed. I can dump him out and get rid of him. So it's a good place to put that sort of floor. My secondary tier is going to be anything where it's a dynamic range, a smear of God knows what, right? I am absolutely thinking about becoming mature. <laughs> I am thinking about becoming activated, you know, that sort of phenotype. I often use these on things like Fitzy. Um, BB570 works fine for these particular two. PE Psi 7 often is necessary depending on how strong of an activation you have instigated. 
Um, and then finally, my tertiary tier is going to be all my best floors. If I can keep them for this, I will. And it's usually when we're building a panel, we work backwards because I am initially limited by only what's commercially available in PE or only what I can resolve with BV421. And I have to go backwards to find out to the um, constituents of my entire panel. So first, before you do anything else, when you're starting to consider that maybe theoretically this is the panel you want to look at, you have to titrate first. Titration is not a big deal in terms of, of staining index or resolvability when you're only working with a limited number of colors in an assay. But I can tell you it matters tremendously when you get above 10, <laughs> largely because you don't want just a mess. I always kind of say it's like your, your cell is a bun and you're just slathering butter all over that bun, eventually it's just going to get too sticky and too slippery for you to hold on to. You're confounding the ability for your antigens to find each other, um, let alone you're creating more and more and more background in each of your channels that's going to further hurt your, your staining index. So the very first thing you do is find your most conservative um, signal to noise. In this case, we use staining index because we want to take into account not just the MFI or the median fluorescence intensity of the negative, but we want to also take into account its distribution, which equally affects my ability to resolve that population. So this is a better, um, you know, a better equation to use. It's more accurate. Um, but again, I do this first. So the rest of the data that I'm going to show you from here on kind of elucidating gates. Um, um, originated from a paper from um, Holden Macker and, and a few others. And there, you know, there's a lot of efforts in the world right now to standardize multicolor for lots of reasons. We have lots of consortia going on, lots of people who want to be able to compare patient samples between groups that are in Mexico versus the UK versus China, right? We want to be able to make valid comparisons between those results. We can't do that at 15 color right now. But lots of efforts like this are trying to do it at eight color. So when I look at this, though, I thought, well, this is a fun opportunity to look at an example to consolidate a panel. If I'm only doing clinical research, I can absolutely consolidate this, um, these five panels into probably two. So I picked on the, um, the B cell panel, the dendritic monocyte and NK cell panel, and then the T cell panel. I did not include a live dead. When you're working with PBMCs or you're working with whole blood, often the scatter helps you get rid of a lot of your live dead. Um, and also you're phenotyping so extensively at 15 colors, usually at some point they, they're lost from what you're gating on. So I did not personally include a live dead. Always a good idea for many reasons, but I dropped it here. Um, and I also wasn't able to include IgD or CD4 in my consolidation, so it wasn't entirely out of um, a consolidation of all three. But this is what my panel looked like. This was my seventh panel, and I'm an expert at developing panels. <laughs> it was a little bit of a, a frustrating learning process, but it was a learning process. We learned quite a bit about this. So um, I'm going to show you some of the mistakes that were made where we lost resolution and couldn't keep that particular configuration. Um, but generally, this is what I ended up with. So online, we have a brand new tool that really helps everyone do this themselves. It's called the Online Panel Selection Tool. And what happens is that you choose the species, you choose the lasers you have, you choose the floors that you have the capability to detect, and then you go through and list out all the, um, all the markers that you want to have, and it will populate what's commercially available from BioLegend for those things. However, we don't carry PE Texas Red. There will be certain things that you don't see on this list. BV711 and 785 haven't been released yet. So I couldn't show them in this particular scenario because they're not commercially available yet. Um, so there are always some things that you don't see, something someone gave you that you have to include in. But still, it's a great way to organize your thoughts and know what's commercially available. And there's a little button on each side that you can click to see what the QC plot looks like to give you an idea of expression level and suitability with that particular floor. So just putting in a plug for that because this has made my life so much easier. Um, this is our particular um, cytometer configuration. As of last week, this is no longer accurate because we finally added a seventh PMT, which shifts all of these so that BV785 is here and it shifts all of them down. Um, so we now have um, an 18-parameter capable instrument. 
Um, we could definitely do 16 colors quite cleanly now. Um, filters can change though. You know, absolutely, your percent comp, your resolution, lots of things will be affected by the band path, pass width or the dichroic filter that's in front of that particular place. So we're not saying that this is the word of God, it's just what works out best for us in our situation. <clears throat> Okay, so in order to get my 15 colors, my 17 parameter immunophenotyping, I really liked how they did it in the paper and I decided to mimic a lot of their gating style. Um, because I know that a lot of my monocyte populations, especially my dendritic cells, I wanted to go after PDCs and MDCs, I knew that I needed to collect as many cells as I possibly could um, just for fortitude. So I made my scatter gate actually quite liberal because I have 15 phenotypic markers that are gonna work down that scatter gate, right? Um, so I have, I have plenty to help me with parsimony. So most of the populations are working off of CD19 versus CD3. The CD3 BB510 rocked. I was extremely happy with this. Um, the reason I use these two together is that they won't be co-expressed tremendously. Um, you know, I'm really looking at my double negatives, my CD19 positives, and my CD3 positives. That's, that's where all my phenotyping is occurring. So, you know, these guys are going to have a decent amount of spillover into each other, and what I wanted to avoid was a lot of the distribution error that happens between channels like this. Um, so, we're working off of the squadroning here. Um, however, quadrants are not always the right gate. Um, we have been doing a lot of work with Brilliant Violet 711. Great bright fluorophore. I think you're going to be quite happy with it. However, if I could make a recommendation, I personally would not choose to put this fluorophore on, um, on any sort of you know, bivariate or in, or in a situation where I really needed to have confidence in my double positives because there is a phenomena that's based on kind of a mathematical artifact of compensation that most of us refer to as spreading error. It has nothing to do with the marker. Well, it has to do with the brightness, thereby the abundance of the marker. But it's really a spectral artifact, hence why it happens when compensation is applied. So what you should notice here is with bi-exponential gating, I had to transform this particular population by negative 500, um, which is in Flojo. This is not Diva. Um, so in that, you can see that this, the distribution of these um, positives are actually quite broad. That has nothing to do with the reagent performance. The dye itself is extremely internally consistent. Um, this is very much a mathematical artifact because as you get brighter and brighter, this number and the standard deviation digitally of this particular value is much larger than when something is dimmer. Okay? You see this all the time. This happens with all floors that spill over into one another. It happens with APC Psi 7 and Alexa 700. It happens with Q.605 and PE Texas Red. But usually those transformation, um, that transformation effect is, is much smaller. This is really just kind of the perfect storm of two reagents that meet all those criteria to actually create a significantly greater spreading error. So that's one thing to keep in mind when trying to actually fill out a full multicolor panel. It does not hurt my ability to resolve four and eight because I am not interested in four positive, eight positive. So I have no trouble here to go to my CD4s and my CD8 and find my memory populations based on that distribution. Um, and so that's where we go from here. So what I do want to show is one of my first mistakes. I almost always like to use CD4 on APC Psi 7. However, when Psi 7 photo bleaches, it leaves APC behind. APC is very bright and very happy to be excited in the red. So when APC Psi 7 starts to degrade or treated harshly or left sitting around too long on the bench in the light, you're more likely to see a loss of resolution in your APC channel where often you have something that you put there because it was hard to detect, right? So that was an example of this. Um, in this instance, when I was using the CD4 APC Psi 7 against a CCR7 APC, which is a brand new clone from us, um, that is fantastic for macaque and human. We find that we're actually getting significantly better resolution with this clone than previous clones. Highly recommend it. My little plug for that. Um, when we're using this, it's not a fantastic resolution. It's not dim, right? It's, it's not lowly abundant, but it's not fantastically abundant. When I use the APC size 7, 
and I start to see a population of background in the APC channel, I lose resolution here. When I apply, and this is actually all this gating is based on FMOs. I can prove to you that these gates are true, okay? Which was why FMOs are so extremely important for exactly this reason, for internal consistency. Um, when I use CD4 Alexa 700, where the spillover, this is not a very bright floor. It's either photo bleached or not photo bleached. It's not spreading like APC Psi 7 does. Um, this is significantly better resolution because my, um, my contributing background is a lot lower. So this was a much better scenario. You do not see the effect when you're not gating on a population that's CD4 positive. If I don't have, if I'm looking at CD8 positive cells and looking at the same distribution and they do not have these floors on them because they are not co-expressed, it doesn't matter. The background isn't there. An event is one cell. If that cell is CD8 positive, it's not CD4 positive. So you're not populating that background. It's one of the best strategies for maintaining resolution is to think about those things. If two things assault each other a lot, make sure that they're not co-expressed. You can do that with immunophenotyping. It's a lot harder when you're looking at a lot of cytokine expression from one subpopulation. That becomes a lot more difficult. All right, so the reason why you, I, I really need um, everyone to start using FMOs more regularly is because gating is not an art, it is a science. You cannot randomly say, hey, I start to see a slight differenti you know, differentiation between these two populations. That isn't valid. So when I'm looking at an activation marker like HLEDR versus CD38, <laughs> try, try randomly drawing a gate there. If I apply the FMO, I know exactly where my negatives are, and I have no trouble drawing that gate consistently between application. Um, Especially as my, te my PE Texas Red starts to change over time, if I keep applying that FMO, I will always be internally consistent. All right, so B cells and monocytes, um, these are just some additional you know, derivations of this 15 color immunophenotyping where I'm looking at 27 versus 3 to look at my naive versus memory B cells. I have my classical versus non classical monocytes, which absolutely required an FMO. I've got so many oddly distinct populations in there that until I overlay it, do I see that I have clearly negative here? These are low, these are high, right? That's how my FMO helps me because if I had just looked at this as a heat map, it would have been really hard for me to make that call on where the negatives actually were. I can't stress that enough. I believe that, that all data should be shown with their FMOs overlaid for things that are difficult to resolve. That's my own feeling on the matter. All right, so then we're going after our dendritic cells and our NK cells. This is pretty easy, 16 versus 56. Again, it's a, an oddly distributed population. You know, we have three different things going on with this particular bivariate. We have cytotoxic NK cells, cytokine-producing NK cells, and hyporesponsive NK cells all contained within this, this plot. Um, we go to um, plasma, plasma cytoid dendritic cells and myeloid dendritic cells based on CD11C expression and that's where we need an isotype. And so because I'm doing 15 colors, I've got limited options. I really needed PE Psi 5 to be on my CD11C because it's bright, right? I needed to benefit from that. So when it came to um, actually using this, I made sure that it wasn't just an FMO that I used. I included the isotype control for PE Psi 5 into the FMO for the panel in order to show what the background binding could potentially be. I hope that makes sense. So, you know, I am getting really decent resolution, but I need to prove to myself that this isn't nonspecific binding. So when I add the isotype control to my FMO, there is no active CD11C PE in this panel, in the red here. The FMO here is in blue, and I can see maybe a little bit, maybe, I don't really know, but I can clearly have evidence to say that I am not seeing PE Psi 5 non-specifically binding um, to this particular subpopulation. That's all that's important is that you can prove it and that it's internally consistent and representative. It's only gonna make your data better. But there will be spillover and there will be sensitivity between all of these probes. So for example, again, I make sure that I list all of my PMT voltages because they are not all equal. 
so that as I start looking at the different percentages, for example, all the brilliant violet floors will spill over into each other. Okay? However, when I look at things like um, when I look at things like BV510, this is the, um, um, the, PM, the, the channel is on top, the floor is here. When I look at 510 into 570, 510 is 480, 570 is 500. It's probably not exactly 50%, really. It's probably lower than that, but that 20 volt differential accidentally over amplified some of the photons that came from BV510 into the 570 channel. It's just an artifact of the amplification that is photomultiplication. Okay, so there's a few other things that we have here. Crossbeam compensation, as we were talking about before, the BV570 has an acceptor that's excited by um, the 561 laser. So when we're looking at the 570 spilling into P, it's about 20% in this instance. You can kind of look at the differential of voltage is not very high. Um, and then again, vice versa, the spillover of PE into 570 is about 23%. And that's because of that short wavelength excitation. Um, there's going to be other you know, combinations where you're going to see the spillover. You're going to see um, APC into BV650, BV650 into APC, and you're going to see 605 into Texas Red, PE Texas Red. This is next to nothing, and that's fantastic, even off of our instrument that has a 561 laser. Um, so we're extremely happy with those sorts of results. It means we're not causing a massive additive problem the same way that Q-dots do because of their absolute promiscuity of excitation. All right, but then what I should also be looking at are the channels that are in here of diminishing sensitivity. So things like BV570, BV421, and especially Alexa 700, it's extremely difficult to maintain resolution in this channel to the point where often I end up dropping it because I can't get what I want and still be able to detect something in that channel. Okay, so there's a lot of things that affect compensation, but fundamentally it is spectral spillover. Right? So if you see two spectra that are overlapping and it only looks like 10% is spilling over but you're getting 100% comp, that's based on voltage. Okay? Because everything else should be internally consistent. Filters do affect compensation, but they should be internally conserved. The instrument shouldn't be changing filters between application. Right? The wavelength of, a, of the excitation laser or the age of the laser, how much output that laser is giving you. Those things can affect the voltage that you would apply, thereby affecting the compensation number that will result. So literally, what it is, and it's, it's just so important for people to understand this in multicolor, how meaningless that number is, when I have something like Fitzy, off of the same laser, Fitzy does spill over into PE, say they're both excited by the blue laser. When I look at that tiny little spectral spillover here, um, it, uh, I'm sorry, here into FL2, into this PE channel, um, it really doesn't look like it's very much, right? It's about 15%. If these voltages were identical, they were both 500, and they performed identically, the PMT hardware itself performed identically, then it should actually accurately represent only that spillover. But that's never the case because we're always balancing these voltages, we're changing them. So what ends up happening is the instrument is not smart, it only sees photons. It says, I am detecting a 100% number of photons into FL1, my FITSI channel, from FITSI. I am ratioing that to the number of photons that my FL2 is telling me is spilling over into the PE channel, right? That's the percent comp theoretically. But what ends up happening is that when this voltage is amplified, it's no longer this, it becomes this. It becomes higher because I have photomultiplied the photons that are detected into my neighboring channel and they are now out of proportion with the actual percent because the number of photons into my primary channel has not changed. It's an artifact. I have over amplified my spillover. Have I changed my compensation? No, I've changed my mathematics. <laughs> That's about it, <laughs> right? But I have not changed anything about the resolution of those populations. So when people tell you, I use CD4 on all of my fluorophores 
and put them on comp beads and run them through the system, or I put them on cells and I run them through, and those are my comp controls. For something like Fitzy, that would be fine. Fitzy is either on or off, but the spectra does not change, right? So yes, I could have CD4 Alexa 647, CD4 Fitzy, CD4 BV421, and I would never see a change in compensation because of something to do with the floor for. Where I would see it and where I cannot follow that strategy is with tandems because this is not simply the spillover of the emission into another channel. It's the ratio of the donor to the acceptor. And this ratio is always changing whether I bought that antibody today, yesterday, a month ago, a year ago. God knows when I bought it because nobody bothered to mark the date on it and it's been sitting in the fridge since I showed up at the lab. Those are all going to have entirely different ratios of acceptor to donor that absolutely will change that percent comp. I cannot just use CD4 for PE Texas Red or PE Psi 7 or PE Psi 5. It won't be accurate. I'll see an under or overcompensated condition because of that. Really, in all reality, even if you're using comp beads, you should be treating them identically to your cells because if you are staining for hours at a time, all of those floors are being exposed to light for that entire time or they're being exposed to solvents, they're being exposed to fixatives that your beads should also be exposed to because all we care is that our comp controls are accurate. We don't care that they're perfect. We care that they're accurate to what's on the cells, right? Okay, so the, re the reason that this is absolutely meaningless, there was a, a good example while we were beta testing for these guys where I was sitting at UPenn in the um, Mike Betts lab with a graduate student of his named Morgan Ruder. Um, we were running through the full sample, which is here, with these voltages applied to these channels. Um, we finished with the entire run, and I took the data off and quickly put it into Flojo just to assess the comp matrix, which was what I was most concerned with at the time. And I said, you know, this doesn't look right to me. And she went back and realized that she had accidentally inverted the voltages between these two channels based on what she had determined to be optimal prior to running the assay. So we had a tiny little bit of our full sample left, which is why there's significantly less cells <laughs> in these plots. And we said, well, I wonder what happens when we just switch these two voltages. First of all, <laughs> BV650 does not bleed into BV605. 75%. And also, BV605 um, does not bleed into BV650 9%. There's some place in the middle where this is actually accurate. But by changing the voltages, by just flipping the voltages for each of these, running the same samples, all we did was flip the percent comps. These are still resolvable. I have not changed resolution. The only time I would change resolution is if my voltage mistake took me out of the linear range of the PMT. That's it. That's why these numbers are meaningless and why we should never refer to them as advantageous or disadvantageous for the floor. They're only one thing that affects sensitivity. Okay, so that's the, the end of this talk. There's a lot of people that have contributed to this entire project. Um, lots of people who have beta tested for us over the last year to help us get to where we are now, applying all the different reagents to their many different biologies. And there's a very tireless team here at Biolegend that has worked night and day to make these dyes possible. So um, we definitely want to extend a thank you to all of them. So thank you very much for your attention.